Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are modern day treasure hunters. Wherever the meteorites fall, that's where we must go. They travel the world in search of meteorites, the alien invaders that have been crashing into our planet for the past four and a half billion years. They're like Lawrence of Arabia out here. On this adventure, Jeff and Steve travel north of the Arctic Circle. There's something magical and alluring about being this far up towards the top of the world. They're in Sweden to conquer one of the largest and most challenging meteorite strewn fields on Earth. You have a strewn field that you don't know where it stops and you don't know where it starts. It's a good detective yeah, story. Yeah, exactly. They hunt deep in the forest. It's like a maze. Battle cold rain. I think, ah, oh, this is going to be difficult. Like and spot. endure endless excavations. I've heard stories where people have had to dig for three days to get these out. But their perseverance pays off. The guys find more buried treasure than ever on one of the richest hunts of their careers. Oh! Oh! Oh, yes! Yeah. Oh, yes! Surprise! <laughs> Jeff and Steve are in the remote region of Norrbotten in Sweden's Northern Territory. We fly eight or nine or 10 time zones away, drive up north of the Arctic Circle. Our baggage is lost. We've lost our metal detector coils. At, at some sites, it wouldn't really matter that much because we could go out and hunt by eye or use the handhelds. But of all the sites to lose the big coils, this is the worst possible one because this is where the meteorites are most deeply buried. Nearly 800,000 years ago, a 60,000 ton meteoroid blasted into the Earth's atmosphere, slamming into northern Sweden. Meteorites land in an area called the Strewn Field. Years of glaciation and melting have moved the meteorites from their initial impact sites. Munyana Lusta is one of the largest known meteorite falls in history. The meteorites aren't sitting where they fell. They've been transported by long vanished glaciers. The meteorites have endured several ice ages over thousands of years. Sheets of ice would inch along slowly, picking up meteorites and other debris. For years, some of the rocks tumbled into each other, grinding down their rough edges. When the weather warmed up, the glacier would retreat creating a ridge of debris called the terminal moraine. We're north of the Arctic Circle, which means for most of the year, the ground is frozen solid. And for several months each year, this area is in 24 hour darkness. There's a pretty narrow window in the spring and summer when you can actually hunt here. And for a large part of that window, the area is infested with mosquitoes. So we're here in this little sliver of time after the mosquito season, before the darkness and the freezing. With no gear or quick way to get it, this hunt begins with the hunt for equipment. Through a mutual friend, Jeff and Steve make contact with Swedish meteorite hunter Thomas Oosterberg who spends summers here with his family. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Thomas. Hello. Steve Arnold. Yes, nice, nice to, meet, to meet, you. meet you, yes. Welcome to the Moon Lester Strong. Well, thank you. Oosterberg made headlines back in 2008 when he unearthed a 1.2-ton meteorite. It's the largest find on record in all of Europe and is valued at an estimated half million dollars. You are not on there either. <laughs> yeah, probably Maybe you find a two-ton. Huh? Maybe. 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 Steve and Jeff are half a world away from their familiar hunting grounds. Without their coils and in unfamiliar territory, for the first time, they must turn to another meteorite hunter for help. Meteorite hunters are, for the most part, a pretty secretive bunch. Meteorites can be worth a lot of money, and so sharing information isn't something that happens every day. A characteristic Thomas doesn't exhibit. Okay, I have something for you. It's uh, oh, coiled to the Polestar. Thank you. That's wonderful. I heard that you lost your... Yes, uh, we have... Thomas is taking his daughter meteorite hunting tomorrow and invites Jeff and Steve to join the hunt. Not only is Thomas immediately a charming and delightful gentleman, he's agreed to go out in the field with us and almost unbelievably, he's agreed to lend us his own coil, his spare coil, so uh, an operation that seemed doomed from the start, has now been saved by his kindness. The next morning, the guys meet Thomas and Corinne at location number one. Oh, oh. it's 
starting to rain. Yeah. It's a site the Oosterbergs have never revealed. Jeff and Steve agree to keep their whereabouts a secret. This area is interesting. There's been found in meteorites south of this area and north of the area I know. And you know to the west, there's been yeah. meteorites found. Really big ones. The paper said the third one was found on a road actually quite far east of here. Yes, about so, uh, five kilometers east from here, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're in the heart of yeah. where there should yeah. be things. Yeah. Exactly. The first Mwanyanalusta meteorite was discovered in 1906 in a small village not far from this site. Since then, others have been found, including one 35 miles northwest of here. Time to open up the magic meteorite hunting yeah. chest. <laughs> Metal detectors are illegal in Sweden, unless you have a permit. Fortunately, the Oosterbergs have an arsenal of hunting equipment at their disposal. There are many different types of metal detectors, but they all operate on the same basic principle, which is they send a signal down into the ground searching for a target. The detectors that we're using here at Munya Nalusta are called pulse induction metal detectors. One of the real advantages of pulse induction technology is it allows you to build a coil of almost unlimited size. So the bigger our coil, the deeper into the ground it can see. I suggested that we split up. Steve and I always hunt together. So Steve went off with Karin and I went off with Thomas. This is a really interesting system, yeah. having two people yeah. work the coil like this. So the idea, it's... of course, is to keep all the metal, which I have, on yeah. me exactly. as far away from the coil as we can. By separating the metal from the coil, the detector can be calibrated to hunt at various depths. Some meteorites found here have been 30 feet deep. Because this unit has greater depth capability, there's a chance that we'll find a meteorite that previous hunters have missed. Steve and Corinne already have a signal. Do you get a number? 45. Yeah, that's iron. Metal detectors are a must in this region because Mwanyanalusta meteorites are composed of 90% iron. They make up less than 7% of all known meteorites. Other types include stone and stony iron. They took all the shovels. Uh, then, dig with your hands, your feet, or your, I don't know. The stick. Over the years, so many Mwanyanalusta meteorites have been found, and my hopes were really high that we would be getting here, and every hour we'd be digging up a new rock. Oh. Uh, it's the same thing. It's official meteor wrong. That's mean. <laughs> a meteor wrong basically is anything that sets off the detector that isn't a meteor wrong. OK. Pick it up and we'll move on. <gasps> OK, let's try with this. OK. What I'm really looking for is, is a consistent sound to the signal. I don't want it to waver. And I don't want it to be too sharp or too shrill because that tells me it's near the surface. So I don't want it to, I don't want it to be too loud. I don't want it to waver. It, it's complicated. It's almost like listening to music. You've got to train your ear. You have to kind of sense what it is. About 9% of Sweden is covered in swampy bogs which makes meteorite hunting exceptionally difficult. But when hunting at this time of the year, some of the marshy regions have dried, allowing Jeff and Thomas to access areas previously impossible to hunt. Thomas and I are walking through the deep forest down a gentle slope towards a kind of a marshy area, and it's getting more and more wet, and it seems almost too wet to proceed. And just at that moment, as I start to turn around, whoa, whoa. Raise the quilt, please. And let it drop again. Very promising, very promising. Uh -huh. Very promising. I like very promising. Jeff or Steve, do you read me over? Hey, Jeff. Hey, Thomas and I got a target. But I was wondering if you'd like to come dig it with us. OK, we're on our way. Oh, there we go. Uh, the light's not going on, but it's reading two on the ferrous scale. Ferrous is any material containing iron. Iron meteorites are composed primarily of iron and nickel, and once formed the core of a planet or large asteroid. Then the red light went on. 
Now the green light went on. Whatever! <laughs> Let's dig it! <laughs> and while Steve's walking over here, I witness a most interesting thing. Thomas picks up a Y-shaped twig from the ground, sort of like a wishbone from a chicken. And it's the kind of thing that I've seen people use as divining rods in old movies, but I've never seen it done in real life. Wow! How does that, how can you explain that? Well, there is something down there. Really? No, I think it's 40%, yeah. I never really believed that that was a real thing. Divining, otherwise known as dousing, has been used to locate everything from water to oil to the body of a missing person. Although there is no scientific justification for divining, some believe dousing rods function like a seismograph, picking up on the subtle movements of the human nervous system triggered by the subconscious. I like this. Thomas takes us out to side and he does the digging. It's just got <laughs> standing. We try to put back the surface. Oh, that's very good. I'm quite surprised at the very specific process that Thomas has developed here for digging at Munyana Lusta. He carefully cuts out a large rectangle of the surface, moss and other growth, lifts it off. I'm like peeling back the scalp. Good, good. Before, uh, good you've got the scalp. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. And everywhere else in the world, you would go, this is not a good sign. Rocks on top of a meteorite. A meteorite punched a hole. Oh, that's a good sign. Yeah, it's yeah. a good sign. It's yeah, a good, good sign. sign. The glaciers have pushed these rocks back and forth, and it's buried these meteorites with the rocks down deep. And so the deeper we go, this is a good sign because the signal's still there. That means the rock's bigger. Oh, no, it's, yeah. OK, I owe you each one a nice bottle of Scotch malt whiskey if it's not a meteorite, I promise that now. <laughs> and you owe me each one if it is a meteorite. Uh, it's just for me. I'll trade booze for a meteorite any day. We take off a few inches, we put the detector back in. Oh, yes. a really good sign. Four. So we're going to hit water here soon? We take off a few inches, put the detector back in. Each time, the signal gets louder and louder. Oh. Now it's six, seven. Yeah. And now it's 70%. <laughs> Holy crap. He just said 70%. Yeah. Right. And he's a pessimist. And he's so... a pessimist! <laughs> I'd say the excitement's mounting here. <laughs> And our first ever Swedish expedition. Well, no. We know we're getting closer, but this is also telling us that the odds of it being a meteorite keep going up with every couple inches that come off. Oh! Yes, oh, there yes, it is. There it is. Yes. Oh. yes. 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 When we uncover a target at the bottom of a hole when we're digging, one of the first things we do is place a magnet on it to see if it sticks. Stick. Oh, yeah! yeah. It sticks! <laughs> He really didn't expect that magnet to, to jump out of his hands. And when it did, you could see the smile on his face. Now you can move it. Yeah, you could. Ooh, it is flat. Yeah, but it's just easy. Look at that. 20 kilo, 20 kilo. What an amazing color. It's not very much rust on it. It's quite clean. There she is. Our, our first ever Munyana Lusta. Oh, it's a really weird color, sort of crimson and red and white mixed together. That's a lot heavier than I expected it was going to be. I've never found meteorites in the Arctic Circle before. I've never dug a meteorite out of a swampy, marshy forest floor. And I've never found a meteorite in the terminal moraine of a glacier. It's just been a fantastic experience all across the board. Woohoo! When it comes to the value of meteorites, several factors come into consideration, including size, rarity, aesthetics, and overall quality. For such a nice piece, I would estimate 30, between 25 and 30 cents per gram. The 44-pound, 20-kilogram meteorite is valued at an estimated $6,000. After digging for space rocks, Jeff and Steve always make a point to restore the land. In the Mwanyana Lusta forests, it's especially important to backfill the holes to protect the wildlife, such as moose and reindeer, from accidental injuries. All right, we're coming in with the toupee. Well, that was a rather good repair job. Yes. Good work, everyone. 
Well, good luck, you two. Yeah. And I uh, will see you back at the truck. Yes. Yeah. OK. Yeah. You sure you can carry that? I'm, I'm sure that I'm going to try. Uh, if you need help, let me know. Thank you. I'll trade you Very out. My great-grandparents were from Sweden, so I've got roots here in Sweden. And so it's exciting to get back here to the motherland, have a chance to hunt for meteorites. I love to do that. Get a taste of uh, where I came from. Then we are here. Valkajärvi, the classic Valkajärvi. So this is where most of the finds were made? The gold mine for uh -huh. Monjolusta meteorites four, five, six years ago. They picked up uh, literary meteorites here every day. Wow. So the four of us are eating lunch, having a nice little conversation, and Karen pulls out this can of something. When she puts that can opener into that can and punctures the top of it, Yes. Ooh. Now it's oh. time for some sp Swedish speciality. <laughs> can you smell that? I can yeah. smell that. Yeah. An aroma comes out of there that I can't even put into words. It was bad. It's fermented uh, herring. Oh. It's uh, supposed to be uh, a very delicate dish up here. And, up here? Uh, so we open the lid. <laughs> the smell's enough to make my eyes water. I mean, it, it, it smells worse than rotten fish. All right, I'm going to take a little walk. You guys enjoy your fish. It's really <laughs> wonderful. I'm so tempted. Do, do I smell it or do I just eat it? Just uh, try to focus on, on chewing it a little bit and then swallow, swallow it as fast as you can. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Yeah. Pay attention. <laughs> yeah. It's not too bad. I mean, the smell is worse. The taste is not that. Hey, you survived. <laughs> Still it's not so bad. No. <laughs> now you are a real, real amateur man. <laughs> I need to go find a meter. <laughs> <laughs> The next morning, Jeff and Steve meet the Oosterbergs at their chalet. The four want to find another big space rock to add to yesterday's 44-pound find. We rode this road right. yesterday, and then we went something like down uh -huh. here. And I think we stopped about here, and the, the new road goes down here. Uh -huh. and I, this area, I have never searched here before. But... Yeah, you have the swamp here, like. Yeah. Yes. So it's you have to cross that, so it's even harder to get here. So before the new road was built, this would have been a very difficult area to get to. In a popular strewn field like Monjolusta, difficult areas make for good hunting because it's less likely to have been picked over by competing meteorite hunters. Yeah. You see, here is almost a river as well, so maybe they were like. Two, Two rivers. Ice, the rivers, yeah. one here and one And this is just in. between them, so this is a very yeah. rich area. Jeff and Steve, along with the Oosterbergs, strategize location number two, an area less than a quarter mile from where they made their first find, valued at an estimated $6,000. The new area is hard to get to, which is why the group is sure big meteorites are here. It's reading 51. Uh, that is iron. Between 40 and 60, it's iron. Well, uh, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but it could still be a trash. Ah. Uh, uh, well, I think it's some kind of hook. That's a pretty good meteor wrong, though. <laughs> wow. No wonder it gave such a loud signal. Yeah. yeah. Steve and Corinne pick up their second signal. What's Ooh. that? Ooh, that is like off the charts. Yeah, it is. Maybe it's like some metal. Yeah, like meteorite metal? Yeah, perhaps. 
We can come in from this angle. Wait, I found oh. it. Oh. <laughs> wow, a file. Yeah. It could be what? like 100 years old. <sighs> but we found something. This is so not right. Yeah. I, well, think, I think you have to have a little bit of a sixth sense to be a successful meteorite hunter. Definitely. Yeah. Well, you and I share that view. Steve is more interested in, in gridding everything. Oh, well. Hunting out here is, is a little bit frustrating in that I like to grid, I like to have a plan. Weren't we here before? We were here before. <laughs> we're going over and over, and up till now, we're not finding anything. <laughs> doot, A new musical. Doot, 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 doot. Cross over here. It's like a maze. No dog up bet you're right so far. It could be a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> yeah. The good thing is that maybe we are first here. What in the... Was it you? I hope not. What do you think? It sounds promising, but it could still be trash. Do you get any readings? Um, not as promising as I hope, but it's still, it could still be a meteorite right there. So of course I have to dig here. Ooh, look, berries. Can I eat these? Uh, hunting with Steve is like hunting with, uh, I don't know, a bear or something. Four blueberries in one swipe. <laughs> he always found like joy in the berries, in the mushrooms. He always like noticed details in the nature. Good I think this meteorite gig doesn't work out. I might become a berry picker. You can pick berries up here, right? Yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, Jeff and Thomas are still trying to pinpoint their target. Oh, there they are. Over here. It's we've only, we've only got up four. to that tree there. Let's give a very clear and sharp signal. Here. All right. I like this. Oh. Here, let's, fact, we'll, let's see if we can find your target. While there's four of us working together and we can take turns with the shovels so we're not all getting too tired, there's only really room for one of us in the hole at a time. And so it's going painfully slow. Well, now you'll see, it's not like an orchard. It's, it's about this bad. Three hours of digging and still no meteorite. I'm okay. getting discouraged. Yeah. I'm right. gonna get undiscouraged. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's see what we got here. Very promising. Oh, nice and Could be bigger than I expected. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're right on it. Yeah, you have almost 10 on the scale. It's, oh, right, yeah. We are close it's maxing now. out. Yeah. The deeper we get into the ground, the more excited we get. Mm. That's not it, is it? No. Oh, OK. The further we go underground, the less likely it is that we're going to uncover a piece of man-made trash. It's still yeah. there. Oh, we're over 10 now. Yeah. Over 10, that's, wow, well, amazing. Either it's a very big one or it's very, very close to it, or mm -hmm. maybe both. Yeah. OK. Who wants should to go I? last six inches? Sharon, shall you? Should I? Sure. Yeah, you should. You're a little bit smaller. You can fit down in the hole and still have room to dig around your feet. I have the opportunity to dig the last inches, so I just jump down and so slowly, slowly digging, digging. A I think I see it. it. What? You see it? Yeah. <gasps> there, there it is. is. Yes. Yay. Yay. Yes. That yeah. looks like iron to me. Yeah. yeah. When I do see the meteorite, it's like, it never gets old, this feeling. It's like your heart starts pumping, and you're like, almost want to dig any, even faster. Do you want rusty. to test it? Oh, yes, the... please. <laughs> rusty, rusty iron. OK, my favorite part. <laughs> oh, yeah. Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> Woo! My you want your <clears throat> oh, thank you. The doctor wants uh, the surgical instruments. You never know how big it is, how it looks, until you get it up. So just this first look, you know that all the work is worth it. Because, yeah, there it is, the meteorite you've been like, searching for for hours. Here she comes. Right here. Ah. 
Oh, yes. yes. A little meal more than 20, 10 kilos, maybe 14, 15, yeah? Wow, wow look shape. at that color, it's lavender. Yeah, it's nicely nice. shaped also. Very nice. Here we are, not only successful in finding treasure, but successful in rescuing a meteorite that's been buried for many, many centuries deep underground. It's a fantastic moment. It's, it's rare for meteorites yeah. here that they are shaped. They're more, usually more or less rounded lumps could be elongated than like the discus, but this is that attitude, I, yeah, really. This rock weighs 22 pounds and is valued at about $3,000. So far, the guys have tallied up an estimated $9,000 haul after just two days of hunting. When iron meteorites are traveling through our atmosphere, they typically heat up to thousands of degrees Fahrenheit, and that sudden increase in temperature can cause the surface to melt and form fabulous, interesting, even sculptural shapes. You know what we do here? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, they are so difficult to find here. So you have to thank somebody up there for every find nowadays. Motivated by the find, they get right back to hunting. Hi. It's only a matter of minutes before the detectors go off again. Oh, it must be some trash. Sounds like they might have something. The blaring signal catches the attention of Steve and Corinne hunting nearby. Hey, guys. Did you find something? Uh, probably trash, 95% trash. Trash? Now we'll see. Has to be trash. But if the small coil is not picking it up, wouldn't that mean that it's deeper? Yes, it is. But you think it's deep trash? Very, very deep trash. <laughs> <laughs> the bigger the coil, the deeper the signal goes, but the more difficult it is to pinpoint your target. What we can really tell is that it's within a two square meter area. That's a big hole if you have to dig it. We hit right away a sand layer and I think, well, this is going to be easy. It's just sand, but that doesn't last long. A few inches down, we hit clay, and the deeper we go, the more dense the clay layer becomes. It's much harder than most sites we've dug out before. And then when we're about three feet down... I hope we don't have to move that rock. No, so do I. We don't hit a meteorite. We hit a pile of rocks that are really densely packed together. And I think, oh, this is going to be difficult. We're digging down, and we get down about a meter, uh, three feet or so, and we run into a boulder. We got a big rock on that side. Yeah. We got a big root on that side. Yeah, now it's more. This is what we are familiar with. Hello, friend. Now, boulders out here can be the size of a car, or they can be the size of your fist. This one's somewhere in between. All I know is this is going to be a tough one to move. Are we going to dig that, the boulder out? Or the big boulder, oh, we have to see, but I'm trying to expose it. It seemed pretty easy because you couldn't see how big uh, the boulder was, but uh, the more you dig, the bigger the boulder became. Yeah, yeah we're it's, really close. It's really, really close. And also really close to the boulder. Yes. I have a feeling this is not good. We run into this really big boulder, and we don't know if we can even get around this thing. The signal indicates the meteorite is right under this rock. How are we going to get it out? Well, we can either dig out this way or try to get enough of the boulder exposed to move the boulder. We might be able to just turn the boulder up on yeah. its yeah. end. I without... think it's the first choice to, uh, to, to, say, to free the boulder's upper surface. Okay. We're running out of daylight, and, and up here north of the Arctic Circle, it takes a lot to run out of daylight. It's been a long day. We don't have time to have to spend five or six or 10 hours digging this boulder out. Oh, rust! Oh! oh yeah! Yeah! Woo! Well, my friend, wow, now it's it time is. for your... The magnet test! Your, the magnet procedure. All right, let's give this a try. Much. Oh, yes. Finally, we expose it, we see a little bit, and there's a little surface about this big, and it's rusty, and it's metallic, and the magnet sticks to it, and yes, it's a meteorite. This is not a 10, maybe three or four. Let's well, see. you know, they can't all be awesome. No. Why not? 
No matter what it takes, the guys are determined to get this meteorite out from under the boulder. If it's like the first two finds, this rock could be worth thousands of dollars. It'll be a tricky thing to get it out. <laughs> we find out this boulder is much too big to even think about moving. And so, plan B, what are we gonna do now? We're gonna start digging the hole out the other direction. And then we dig underneath the meteorite, and hopefully we can push the meteorite down and out from underneath the boulder. So we start this strategy, we get most of the way down, and what happens, we hit a second boulder that's right on the other side of our target. Trying to estimate how big this boulder is, if it's possible to lift up or you have to let it be. We've got bad weather, we've got a target that's stuck almost underneath a tree. We have a giant boulder here, a giant boulder there. They're not moving. The only thing that will allow us to get this meteorite out is determination and smart tactics. And we just keep going and we keep going and we're not going to give up. I'm not leaving that target in the ground until I know what it is. Yay! Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. Give me time. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Congratulations, team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, look at that. It's like a triangle. That's impressive. Wow. Mm. That's <laughs> Thank you. Finally, it comes out of the ground, and it's a beautiful sculptural piece. It's completely atypical of the type of rounded, characterless meteorites that usually come out of the ground here. This one's a beauty. It was a struggle. It was worth every bit of effort we put into it. Here it is, very nice. Top quality and unique Moignan Alusta meteorites can sell for as much as 60 cents a gram. At 67 pounds, this space rock could go for an estimated $18,000. Want to grab it? Yes, I do. Let me, sir. I don't have to. Ah, it's not so bad with two guys. No. <laughs> uh, I think all the guys are happy, and especially my dad, because, yeah, he feel like uh, Stephen Yeff like, really got a good trip here in Sweden. Another good day, partner. After another long and successful day in the field, the guys estimate the value of their three finds at $27,000. The Oosterbergs aren't able to join the guys tomorrow. So Jeff and Steve are on their own. The help that Thomas and Karin have been giving us and the practical help of, of working with us in the field, it is invaluable to getting this hunt and getting it successful. Nobody can argue that they produce meteorites. They pull them out of the ground every time they come out. One of the real pleasures in my work is benefiting from the knowledge of academics, specialists in their field. Hello, Klaus. Are you there? Yes, hi. Today, we have the great privilege and pleasure of speaking with a glaciation specialist. Dr. Klaas Hedestrand spent the last two decades studying Scandinavia's glaciers and reconstructing the ice sheet patterns of northern Sweden. In his research, Dr. Hedestrand has done what no other scientist or meteorite expert has been able to do. By compiling GPS coordinates of finds from meteorite hunters, he has reconstructed the Moanian Alusta strewn field. I definitely can see the original strewn field in, in the pattern. Is it your opinion that maybe there is a strewn field pattern here that's only been mildly disturbed? Precisely as you say, in the central parts of ice sheets, such as in this case, uh, the ice sheets are quite often uh, frozen to their beds. That means that an original strewn field in this area doesn't necessarily have to be transported away just because we have had ice sheets over the area. One of the research papers that we have talks about a terrestrial age of 800,000 years. Is, is that yeah. still regarded as, as, as accurate? Personally, I doubt that it is that old, actually. And if that was the true age, I don't think that we could have seen this original strewn field anymore. I think that we would have been completely obliterated. Uh, do you have any advice for us where to go and where to hunt that might uh, put us in a, a better shot of finding something? Well, the largest meteorite fragments have been found in the south-southwestern part of the strewn field. 
So that's a place where I would be looking. What's intriguing me the most about our conversation with Klaus is, in a sense, it's the reverse of the kind of science we usually do. We study meteorites and they teach us about the history of the solar system. In this case, Klaus is using meteorites to learn about the history of our own planet. He believes that by studying the distribution of meteorites in the Munyanalusta area, he is able to reconstruct past movements of ice flows. Well, that's good advice. Thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. I'm very excited to get back out into the field and put some of that knowledge to use. Jeff and Steve head right to where Dr. Hedestrand suggested, the southwest corner of the strewn field. Location number three is the heaviest hunted area. The guys are banking on a new way of unearthing big iron space rocks. The only problem is, the Mwanyanalusta strewn field overlaps with the homeland territory of the indigenous Scandinavian community known as Sami. We can't just barrel in there and take what we want. People own land, their traditions, their rules and regulations. And it's important to get the proper permission before we start hunting and digging. Hello. I'm Steve. The Sami pride themselves as people with their own unique language, culture, and religion. Best known for their reindeer herding, many continue the practice today. Henrik, since this land has been in your family's possession for so many years, we wanted to ask permission if we could travel across the land and look in this area for meteorites. Yeah, that's OK. Thank so you. So long as uh, you don't uh, uh, destroy uh, nature and, and put it back, it's it fine. Preservation of the land has been vital to the Sami, who depend on the reindeer for both food and source of income. Have you met other people that have been looking for the meteorites? Here? Yeah, I have seen uh, quite a few. Well, we should probably get to work and take advantage of this beautiful day. I think so. We, we really appreciate your kindness. Yes. Thank you for the coffee and the campfire and the permission to visit your land. Yeah. And we promise to be very respectful. That's great, Dan. Uh, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet yes. you, too. Pleased Thank you. So, Steve, here's my new strategy. Oh. You want to hear it? Sure. Um, Instead of going to the places where you, that you can actually walk through, we go through all the most difficult to reach spots. Yeah. Figuring that people are gonna hunt the easy bits first. Uh-huh. I'm with you. Is that you? No. I like that. Houston, we have a signal. Wow. Is it in the tree, under the tree? I think it might be right between these two trees. If a meteorite's three or four or five feet underground, even our powerful 18-inch pulsar is not going to see it. So we have to try and pinpoint a medium-sized meteorite that's deep underground with a gigantic detector, and it's really difficult. You have to move this way and that way and try and zero in, and it's part guesswork and, and part brain power. <laughs> It's in there. I like the sound of that. I say it's here. I think it's right there. Steve says it's here. We're only about six inches apart. So we split the difference and start digging. <laughs> the rocky soil is good because that's evidence that it's part of the glacial moraine. Right. We have to be prepared to spend a minimum of one hour, possibly three hours, digging three, four, five feet down into this hard clay and shifting big boulders as we go. Uh-oh. What now? Boulder. It's no cakewalk. Ah! Don't break my hammer, it's my good oh, one. And there's another rock on top of this rock. How lucky can you get? We have to get this boulder out. <laughs> oh, no. We dig into the wall a little bit, and we see that there's this other boulder on top of the big boulder. <sighs> I think we've reached an impasse. Never. And so finally, we're able to wiggle the bottom one just <laughs> enough to get the top one out. <laughs> you weren't kidding. There's a big rock at the bottom of the hole. That sounds fantastic. Should be right there. It should be right there. 
It's not right. You there. said it was going to be right under the boulder. Uh, this is a tough dig. This is as hard as it gets. It's in a very difficult spot. Our target's right up against a tree. The ground's very dense. There are roots we have to be careful of. Ooh. There we go. That looks red. That's it. Where's my rock pick? Just stick it down there. All right. Come on, let's get it out of the ground. Is it moving? Is it moving? No. <laughs> oh, I thought it was going to oh, come there out. Oh, there it is. Now. There it is. Yep. It's <sighs> in the boulder. <laughs> Are you really putting some backbone into it? <sighs> oh, cool. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Woo! Look at that. That's bigger than it looks. That is so. Yeah, it is. It's like a big brain. <laughs> it's a potato. Wow. I... It's amazingly rounded. This thing's 40, 50 pounds. This is a big rock. That would be a cutter, I would say. I would say it would be a cutter. It'd be perfect for slices. Yeah. There's some meteorites that are aesthetically beautiful, and it hurts to decide, do I want to cut this or not? This rock, there's no question about it. It's round, it's lumpy, it looks like a potato. There's nothing really special about it aesthetically, so it's going into the saw. We're going to be able to cut slices of this thing. The interior of the Munion Lusta meteorite is one of the most beautiful iron meteorites on the planet. One of the things that makes the Munion Alusta meteorite so desirable for collectors is the Widmanstaten structure that, that appears on the interior of these meteorites. When cut and etched, it's one of the most beautiful etches known to man. Iron meteorites are composed of the minerals camisite and tinite. When a differentiated asteroid cools, camisite and tinite crystallize at different rates. The low nickel camisite cools slowly, truncating on the corners of the faster cooling tinite. The result is equilateral triangles called an octahedron that creates the Widmanstaten pattern. This meteorite as a whole stone is probably worth around 30 cents a gram. In slices, though, it's worth about a dollar a gram. This 44-pound iron is valued at about $6,000 whole, or up to $20,000 in slices. Good job. It's a battle, and every time we win that battle, I can't help but feel joyful and victorious. You want a hand with that? Yeah, I'm all right. We walk up to the tip of Munina Lusta Island, where it sticks out into the oncoming river. It's an incredibly beautiful spot. And we start washing off the meteorites, and mud and dirt, and sand comes off, revealing a remarkable kaleidoscope of colors. It's one thing to pull them out of the ground, but when they're washed off for the first time, you really get to see the color and structure. This one's definitely got more of an orange patina, and that's got a little bit more of a, a brown look to it. And it still has a little bit of that violet color on it here. Yeah, we don't so really expect iron meteorites to be so colorful, and, and the colors are a result of oxidation in our atmosphere. We're finding it in one of the most beautiful places on the face of the Earth. Wonderful people. The story of this rock being moved around by glaciers and not knowing where the uh, strewn field is, is, well, I, I hesitate to use the word unique, but is there anything else out there that is uh, even comparable? Not that I know of. After cleaning the rocks, Jeff and Steve are eager to get a rough idea of their total weight. 30.3 now, so about 64 pounds, 65 pounds, something like that. The four meteorites add up to 175 pounds, worth an estimated 36 to $56,000, depending on how they've been prepared. 175 pounds in one trip? Rocking. It is rocking. One unique thing about iron meteorites is hidden within the rock, a fingerprint that forms over millions of years. 
What really characterizes the eye meteorites is that wonderful Wittmann stacking pattern that we see on them. And that's the result of very, very slow cooling. And it cools down to about 1,500 degrees centigrade and starts to solidify. But something happens, something very strange happens at about 800 degrees centigrade. The crystal structure changes, and we get these linear features. So if somebody brings in what they think is an eye meteorite and it's got a well-developed Wittmann stacking pattern, we know it's extraterrestrial. Jeff and Steve are anxious to test a slice of their Mwanyinalusta rock. Oh, good lord, it's already coming up. Using a ferric chloride solution, Jeff and Steve test a slice from their expedition. So now if we leave this agent on here, it'll just slowly continue to darken the etch. And so to remove the last traces of the chemical, we put it into an alcohol bath. The type of bands that we see within an etched meteorite helps us identify what kind of meteorite it is. So examining the Widmanstaten pattern of an iron meteorite is not only a journey into the mysterious and otherworldly beauty of iron meteorites, it's also a step towards understanding and classifying what type of meteorite it is. There's no faking that one. Oh, <laughs> you might say not. it's the acid test to prove whether or not it's a genuine meteorite. Oh. Before they head back to the States, the guys make one last stop. Well, not only have you been such a, a good new friend and shared your knowledge, but thank you for lending us the equipment uh, as well. Most uh, meteorite hunters would not do that. No, I know. <laughs> and I seem to think there was a moment where you said, well, if it's not a meteorite, I'm going to buy both of you a bottle of scotch. Yes. And then I think you might also have said, well, if it is a meteorite, you're both going to have to buy me a bottle of scotch. And so, as a thank oh. you for oh. your many kindnesses, here are two bottles of scotch. Oh. Don't, okay. don't, don't drink it all at the same time, OK? Uh, no, I, I take one uh, today and another tomorrow. That's good. <laughs> that works. Uh, our first expedition to Sweden, my old motherland, has been a tremendous success. Couldn't be happier. The rocks are solid. They're not rust balls. They're not falling apart. This has been incredible. I have a lot of fantastic experiences in my life as a meteorite hunter, but today was a really great day.